In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, the Bible says, beginning in verses 12, I'm sorry, verse 6, Hosea 4, 6, the Bible says, My people are destroyed, why? For a lack of knowledge. So the reason why the people of God would, would be destroyed at any time, the Bible says, My people are destroyed, why? For a lack of knowledge. Now, brothers and sisters, this is not talking about ignorance. This is not talking about a type of knowledge that you just didn't know about. But the type of knowledge that we don't know that is going to destroy us is a knowledge that though the light has come, we reject that knowledge to hold on to our own ways. In fact, look at what it says. It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast what? Rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. I think that's a serious statement, brothers and sisters. That the reason why God's people are destroyed, the Bible says, is for a lack of knowledge. Not because God did not make that knowledge available to us. But because even though he's given us the light of his word, we have rejected the knowledge of God to receive the traditions and the ideas of men. And tonight, we need to plead with God that he will do something special in us that if we have rejected knowledge, that we will go to our, that God of mercy and say, Lord, forgive me and help me to begin again. Amen. You know, when the sun is setting right now, as it sets, as we studied last Friday night, we enter sacred time. We enter holy time. We enter into a day that has been blessed by God, and man can't reverse what God has placed on this day. There is a special blessing that we're entering now, and we can have it, brothers and sisters, if we simply open up our hearts to Jesus. I want that blessing tonight. How about you? Tonight's message is a very serious message. Tonight's message is so significant that if we don't understand the message tonight, we'll be lost in these last days. You see, there are certain truths that God has given for the last days that if we do not understand them, we are preparing to be deceived. Tonight's message is entitled, How to Tell a True Prophet. You know, there are many false prophets, amen? Amen. In fact, I'm going to show you tonight that the reason why men are going to receive the mark of the beast is because of false prophets. And unless you understand the difference, unless you know from the Bible how to tell a true prophet, how to know from the Bible who is true and who is false, we'll never be ready for the coming of Jesus. And so before we get into the message tonight, how to tell a true prophet, I'm going to ask that we might reverently approach the Lord in prayer. But I'm going to ask and say this, please. You know, for the last couple of times, I've been trying to overlook it. But it seems as if we're forgetting what reverence really means. Did you know that? You know, people come to church sometimes and in buildings where God's presence is here and they talk and chew gum. We have forgotten what it means. Do you know, one of the other nights, someone came to this church and tried to steal the air condition. Can you come to a church and try to steal it? You know that the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from this earth. When a man can come to, there was a time, gangsters would not even do certain things around a the church. They pull off their hats, they say, I won't say that, and we are coming to a generation that has lost all sense of holiness. Jesus is about to come, brothers and sisters. And so please, don't make me embarrass you today, amen? Please. If someone has to talk, don't do it in the presence of God here. Maybe you just need to simply get up kindly and walk out of those doors. Amen? In this room where the meetings are being presented and where the Bible is being opened, we want to show reverence for God. We want to hear what he's saying to us. 
And we, brothers and sisters, want to show God, we believe that he is really the God of the universe that has come to be with us. Amen. And so if you have forgotten during this message, I'll remind you. Because we are coming into the presence of a holy God. And what we hear tonight, either somebody is going to be ready for salvation or they're going to be preparing for eternal damnation. And so I want to make sure that we hear what God says. Amen. And so before we get into that message tonight, please, would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer. Our Father, creator of heaven and earth and sea, thou who has created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, who blessed it and set it aside for holy use, and though thousands have your plan reversed, resting now upon the first, that as we search the book we'll know that there is no scripture tells them so. But Lord, now we, as we have seen and studied your Bible, as we see the holiness that you have placed upon this day and that you have never removed it, we want to honor you, Lord. We've honored men by obeying what they have said, but Lord, now we want to obey God rather than man. And so we ask that you would bless us, Lord. That as we come into the message tonight, that you will convince and convict our hearts. That you will remove every distraction. That you will alert our minds. Lord, we give all of our time to this world. And Lord, very few are giving the time that we need to Jesus. But tonight we're asking that you will do something special. Tonight we're asking that you will awaken us, that you will arouse us, that you will show us our need of Jesus before it is too late. That we might understand the truth of your word, that we might know how to tell a true prophet. That we might not be deceived, but saved in these last days. Oh, abide with us now, be with those that are on their way. And we ask for a double portion of your spirit. May angels walk up and down this assembly, and may we know that we have been with Jesus. Now and abide with us, we pray, for we ask this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Thessalonians. If you will take your Bible and turn with me to the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want to notice what the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, if you have your Bibles, just raise them up high. Let me know you have your Bibles. Amen. Now, if you don't have a Bible, please, if this is your first time, I want to make sure that you're sitting next to someone who has a Bible. You want to see for yourself what the Bible says. You see, brothers and sisters, we have proven night after night that you and I are not living in any ordinary times. We are living on the very verge of a great and stupendous crisis. We are living in a day and hour. We are living in a generation where the crisis over the seal of God and the mark of the beast is going to determine our eternal destiny. This crisis is going to determine whether we are eternally lost or whether we are eternally saved. This crisis is going to determine, as I said, whether we make it into the kingdom of God or whether we are put into the punishment that God has prepared for the devil and his angels. And God is telling us today that before he comes, there is going to be the greatest deception that this world has ever seen. In fact, notice what the Bible says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verses 8. Are you there, amen? amen? Beginning in verse 8, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, and then 
shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume, how? With the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, the Bible says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. The Bible says that the devil before Jesus comes is going to work with all power and signs and lying wonders. And the world today is preparing for this great deception. In fact, brothers and sisters, we are told that when you study the Bible, we are told that the devil in heaven deceived a third of the angels when he was in heaven. And if the devil has deceived a third of the angels... In fact, when he came to this earth, the Bible says that Adam, who was perfect, Adam, who knew and talked with God, was able to be deceived by the devil. And if the devil could deceive angels that were perfect and men that were perfect, what makes us believe that he can't deceive us? You see, brothers and sisters, the Bible says that in his last days that the devil is going to do all that he can to deceive the power, to deceive the world, and he's going to work with all power. In fact, notice what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Bible says that Satan is going to use everything. Do you know that the Bible even says that Satan himself is going to transform himself and make himself look like an angel of light? And so if you think that you can just look and just think that the devil is going to come with a pitchfork with some red hoof and some red tail, you are deceived, brothers and sisters. The Bible says that he's going to make himself look like a minister of righteousness. It is going to look so close. In fact, we are told that very soon Antichrist will perform his marvelous miracles in our sight. And so close will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. That by their testimony, the scriptures, every miracle and every statement must be tested or we will be deceived. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, you're there, amen? Beginning in verse 13, notice what it says. 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 13, the Bible says, For such are what? False apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves, how? into the apostles of Christ but not only the apostles not only false prophets and teachers the Bible says in verse 14 and no marvel why don't be surprised for Satan himself is transformed until an angel of light the Bible says the Bible says don't be surprised not only the workers of the devil but the devil himself will transform himself until an angel of light and the world is going to be deceived by this manifestation and brothers and sisters you better understand that if you don't understand and know the Bible that you will be deceived right along with it this is why I tell you every night don't listen to a man don't even listen to this evangelist unless what you see is in the Word of God don't believe it you see there are too many that are being deceived by tradition and churches and ministers and pastors and family members and the Bible says that the whole world is going to be deceived and only those who put the Bible above everything else are going to be prepared to meet Jesus. In fact, notice what it says in the book of Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, what book did I say? Galatians chapter 1, notice what it says. Do you know that the apostle Paul, Under divine inspiration, he said that this work of deception is going to be so great, he told his believers that even if an angel came from heaven and they said something different than what he preached, he said, don't believe it. Even if the apostle Paul, if the devil were to pretend and try to bring him back from the grave and say what I wrote in the Bible was not true, he said, don't believe it. Then if demons and all the rest and the host of hell and angels were to say something different than what is in the Bible, the Bible says, let them be accursed. Notice what it says. I'm not making this up. Galatians chapter 1. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 
Beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, I marvel that what? That you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto a what? He said, listen, there is a true gospel, but I'm so surprised at you that you are being called to another gospel. In fact, verse 7, the Bible says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would do what? What does pervert mean? Someone that would change or corrupt. Someone that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But notice verse 8, the Bible says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed, the Bible said. The Bible says if an angel were to come down from heaven as an angel of light and say that what the Bible says is not true, that you were to say that you are not of God, but you are of the deception of the devil. And brothers and sisters, that means that we must believe the Bible. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you something tonight. Because the world is being deceived right now. And you must understand, the great controversy is all about worship. Whether we're going to worship the true God of heaven or whether we're going to worship the devil under the symbol of the beast and his image. And it's all about worship. And there are some people that believe that if we just mention the name of Christ, then everything has to be all right. That if we just say we're preaching the gospel, that everything's all right. But the Bible says there is another gospel. There is a perverted gospel that is deceiving the world today. And if someone preaches it, the Bible says even if it were an angel, let him be accursed. I want to ask you something. If the devil will pervert gospel ministry and the gospel message, do you think that he could also bring about a counterfeit gospel music? You see, you must understand, brothers and sisters, that the devil understands the way the human mind works. And do you know that even more powerful than the eyes is the ears? Now, as somebody said to me one time before, why is it that you attack the television so much? And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to attack it and attack it until it's dead. You see, that television is destroying the mind of man and is taking away the time that should be spent in prayer and in the search of the scriptures. And one reason why I hate it so much is because of this. You see, I never used to understand this. When we start watching sitcoms, whatever it is, did you know, you know how long sitcoms are? 30 minutes. Do you know that they have a certain amount of, cart, uh, 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 of commercials that come in that a sitcom is really about 26 minutes? And they break it up about 10 minutes and a commercial comes on two or three times and then it's over. Do you understand that the television is destroying the attention span of the world? i never forget it. I never could enjoy studying the Bible until I stopped looking at the television. The Bible was always boring and uninterested. I never wanted to search it, but I'll never forget that when I started studying the Bible, I went and I was visiting one of my family members, and they were watching television. And I came into the house, and I was talking to them. And it seemed like that television just got on my nerves as the person was watching it because every 10 minutes a commercial came on, and all of a sudden, you know what time it is when a commercial comes on. Let's go get the drinks and do this. Oh, and then all of a sudden the commercial goes, show us back on, let's get back. And the attention span is broken up. And so you know what has happened? It has created a generation that only has an intention span of five minutes. And when a person comes to hear the Bible, after five minutes, their attention span is gone. They miss it. Their mind wonders here and there what they did at work. They come back. They miss the message. And the devil is trying to deceive the world, but not only with the television, brothers and sisters. Do you know that scientists have found that the ear has more nerves connected to it than the eyes? And Satan knows about music. Do you know that when you study through the book of Ezekiel 28, that the Bible says that Satan was prepared so that in his body, in his throat, he could speak with all different four parts of the harmony all at one time. His body and mouth could make the sound of both vocal and instrumental music. He was the leaders of the choirs in heaven. Satan understands music. You better understand something, brothers and sisters. Satan will even use perverted gospel music to bring the world to a perverted gospel message. And do you know today that most people are going to churches not because of the message? We are going, please don't help me now, I just want us to listen. We are going to church 
And the emotionalism gets us up and we see a type of music that it ministers to the body and everybody's ready to jump up and down and clap and have a good time, but they're not interested in studying the Word of God. People are interested in raising their hands, saying how holy those hands are on Sundays and Saturdays, but those hands are not holy throughout the week. Those same hands don't even really pick up the Bible. You see, brothers and sisters, we are told that in the last days that the devil would use music to deceive the world. You write down in your notes, Daniel chapter 3. You remember that when Daniel was in, 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 in Babylon, that, that, that the devil was trying to get all the world to worship that golden image. And there was a music that played that got the entire world to worship and bow down on the plains of Shinar to worship an idol that they knew was of the devil. Do you know that music actually can control the mind? Do you know that scientists have studied? And they say that music is the most potent medicine even in the world today. Do you know, have you ever been in a store? And all of a sudden you're walking with the grocery basket and the music on, and before you know you're dancing with the grocery basket. The music has taken control of your mind. You can be sitting down somewhere and hear a particular rhythm and beat, and your feet will start tapping, your head will start moving, which tells us that the music has already taken control of your brains. And we don't even have to worry about rap music and reggae music and all the rest. That music came straight from hell. We better understand something. Do you know, have you ever studied the history of music? Remember, God's people are destroyed for what? A lack of knowledge. We don't study anymore. We just accept everything that's handed to us. We don't study for ourselves. Do you know that when you study the history, do you know what jazz you have your, do you know what the word jazz means? Does anyone know what the word, do you know the word jazz means ejaculation? It means the man, the male semen coming out, and we don't even know where it came from. It came from New Orleans. And in New Orleans, there was the jazz music that was everywhere, and the way it got to New Orleans was because of the slave trades. And the slave trades that dropped them off in New Orleans. They came back from different areas like Africa. And they came back from different areas like the Congo. And when they came from there, they took the worship and the music that was there from their gods. Now you must understand that all of that music, it centered in a little Congo area. And it developed around the worship that was built on voodoo. You heard of voodoo? You know what the central instrument is in voodoo music? It is the drum. Voodoo Central music is the drum, and when you study it, do you know, brothers and sisters, that when the voodoo music was played, what they used to do, they would play a particular beat, and the beat would play, and it would be so repetitious until the minds of the men went into a trance-like state, and they called it a loa, which is a lesser god that they said would take over their bodies, and the gods would take possession of them. They would start stomping their feet. They would start shouting and screaming as these gods took possession of them. And this is what was called voodoo and even worship. But it came over from the slave trace to New Orleans. And from New Orleans, you know what happened with it? A bunch of Christians started looking at it and said, you know what? Our music is too boring. They said it's not exciting enough. We need to jazz it up. And so they took the jazz music of the world and they mixed it with Christian lyrics and they combined and the result was an amalgamation that belongs to the devil. And somebody says, what do you mean, evangelist? I'm not telling you something I don't know about. Do you know I used to write rap music? I used to write it down and have where I developed CDs and I was into this music and I never knew how serious it was and be until at one night a demon came to my room several times. And they said they had permission to be there because of the rap music I used to listen to with all of the beats that belonged to the devil. And I remember they would visit my room. They would hold me down sometimes on the bed where I could not move or speak. And they would hover above me acting like they wanted to destroy me. And I remember that one night, my brother was telling me, I'll never forget, he woke up in the middle of the night and he started breaking up all of his CDs. Destroying all of his CDs. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, you'll never know what just happened. He said, listen. He said, a demon just came into this house. And when it came into the house, I was trying to push that demon out. And nothing I could do would stop the demon from, from coming into the house. And I tried. And he said, he said he had permission to be here. And all of a sudden, the demon went past him into the room where we were. He came into the room and he said that the demon hovered above the CD player. And said, I don't have to leave because as long as my music is here, I belong here. And then all of a sudden, he tried to move and break up the DVDs and uh, CDs and tried to push the spirit some more. And then it hovered over my bed while I was sleeping. 
And he said, get away from my brother. Get away from my brother. And all of a sudden, the demon spoke to him and said, oh, you're talking about this young man here? He said, he's mine already. Can you imagine what it was like for the devil to say that I was his? But praise God, the Bible says that Jesus can set us free and that when we know the truth. And brothers and sisters, to take that music and try to blend it with the words of Christ is an abomination. In fact, notice what the Bible says in the book of Corinthians. What book did I say? 2 Corinthians 6. We'll come back to Galatians 1. In 2 Corinthians 6, notice what the Bible says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in fact, do you know Kurt Franklin's song, Stop? You ever heard it? Do you know that when you play the song backwards, there's a part and a chorus, it actually says, perform for Satan. Did you know that? Did you know that when you take these beats, in fact, I want you to make sure, you don't take my word for it, I want you to search it out for yourself. You know what I want you to do? I want you to write this name down. You're going to 2 Corinthians 6. I want you to write this name down. Thomas Dorsey. Write that down. Thomas Dorsey is known as the father of contemporary gospel music. Do you know that every contemporary gospel artist today has dedicated his music to the devil before it ever hits the charge? Did you know that? Thomas Dorsey is called the father of contemporary gospel music, and we call it blackness. It's not blackness. You see, brothers and sisters, we better understand that there is a culture of heaven, and those that are going to be saved are going to accept the principles that God has gave. You see, the devil's music, what it does, it tries to motivate and motivate the body. Remember now, the devil, he used the body to get to the soul. You remember there was a song by R. Kelly not too long ago. He said, my mind is telling me no, but my body says yes. The Bible spoke of the same war, and the devil uses the body to destroy the mind. He tries to get us moved and emotions and all the rest, but Jesus, he doesn't do that. The Bible says, come let us reason together. And you'll notice that when you look at the music of heaven, you hear the melodic instruments. Do you know that scientists have literally done studies with plants and animals and human beings, and they have found, I have some of the studies here, and they have found that when they put some of that rhythmic uh, gospel music and they put it next to plants and animals, that it literally destroyed the plants. It destroyed the minds of the mouse. It destroyed uh, the, 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 the circulation in the body. It affected all of the heart's beat and the rates. And the Bible says that brothers and sisters, God wanted to save us from this. God has given us the truth, but the devil has given us a counterfeit. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 14, are you there, amen? Notice what it says in verse 14. The Bible says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have what? Righteousness with unrighteousness. And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Belial? What part have he that believeth with an infidel? The Bible says you can't take the music of the world and mix it with the words of Christ and get a music that God can accept. Do you know that there was not one Christian in the 1800s, not one church, when Thomas Dorsey first put this together? And if you don't believe me, I have a Jet Magazine article where they say that he took the blues and the rhythm and beat of the world and he put the music together and they said that no church, not one Christian church would accept it. They called it the devil's music. And it wasn't until years later. And this is why the Bible says in Galatians 1. This is why the Bible says in Galatians 1 that the devil is trying to deceive us into a false and counterfeit worship because if he can get us not to think, he can destroy us. In fact, not long ago a music song was made and it said everybody plays the fool. Sometimes. It says when the music starts to play, the ability to reason is swept away. Heaven on earth is all you see. You're out of touch with reality. The Bible has warned us against these deceptions. And Galatians says, I don't care if an angel from heaven said it's all right, that if it's not accordance with the Bible, let it be accursed. In Galatians 1, notice what it says. Are you there? Amen. Beginning in verse 7, notice what it says. The Bible says, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, 
So say I now and again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than you have received, let him be a curse. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to do what? Do you know that there are people that will not tell you what I told you tonight because they're afraid of hurting feelings? They're afraid of teaching the truth. But brothers and sisters, if you are lost and you are deceived, if you come up in the judgment and say, why didn't you tell me the truth? Then I'm going to have to look at God and say, Lord, I knew the truth, but I didn't share it with him. And I want you to study for yourself. I want you to search it out because we're told that just before the close of probation, that every uncouth thing would enter the church, that there would be shouting and drums and rational beings would not be able to make right decision and that this would be called the moving of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit never reveals himself in such a method with such a bedlam of noise. The result is an invention of the devil to cover up the pure, ennobling, sanctifying truths of the word of God. The devil does not want us to get into the Bible. And this is why God is trying to tell us to study for ourselves. In fact, in Matthew 24, notice what the Bible says. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus warned us about all these things. We must understand that just because we come in the name of Christ does not mean that it's all Christ. There are going to be many that say in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't I? And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. In Matthew 24, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. And somebody says, well, isn't the words Christian? But tell me something. If you turn down the words to a song, and you can't tell if it's dance music or the music of God, I think there's a problem. There should be a clear distinction, as clear as light and darkness, as clear as day and night from the worship of God and the worship of the devil, from the music of God and the music of the devil, from the children of God and the children of the devil. For the Bible says in the last days, notice what it says in verse 4. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 4, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Do what? Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come out in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive how many? Some are going to even come in the name of Christ and pretend to be Christ. And the only way that we can know the truth is not by listening to what we say or what we think or how we feel. But we must know the Bible for ourselves. The Bible says it's going to be so deceptive. that look at what it says in verse 24. Verse 24 says, verse 24 says, for there shall arise what? False Christ and false prophets. And shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, it would do what? It would deceive the very elect. And if Satan could deceive the angels and men, he can deceive us today. He is going to make himself and his music look like an angel of light. And the Bible says that this is why we must study for ourselves. Because in the last days, it is going to be so deceptive that if it were possible... It would deceive the very elect. Now the elect, they're not those who are watching Desperate Housewives. The elect are not those that are going down to the theaters and not spending time in prayer and study. The elect are those that are fasting and praying and have forsaken all to follow Jesus. And yet the Bible says that if it were possible, it would even deceive them. But brothers and sisters, this is why God says this time is going to be so deceptive that I must give my people an added advantage. I must give my people something that no one else has so they will not be deceived in the last days. I must give my church, my people, a prophet. Notice what the Bible says, 2 Kings chapter 6. What book did I say? 2 Kings chapter 6. You see, God knew that as Satan would work with such deception in the last days that God says, I'm going to give my people something else. You know that the work of the ministry of the prophets was to unveil the deceptions of the devil so that he would be shown for what he really is. It was to show his tricks, his ambushments, so that the average mind would not have to be deceived if he simply believed the prophets. In 2 Kings 6, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In 2 Kings chapter 6, notice what the Bible says, beginning, beginning in verses 8. You're there, amen? 2 Kings 6, beginning in verses 8. Notice what the Bible says. This is a most powerful situation. The Bible says, verse 8, Then the king of Syria, one of Israel's God's people's most dangerous foes, warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such a such a place shall be my camp. Verse 9 says, 
And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not what? Such a place. For thither the Syrians are come down. Now you must understand what's going on. Here the people of God are getting ready to be ambushed by their greatest enemies. And they're being sent up. And one of the prophets of God goes to his people and he says, Listen, don't go by that way anymore. Don't go that way because if you go that way, there is an ambushment that is set up to trap you if you go that way. And the man of God said, all right, prophet, I'll listen to you. And he goes a different direction. And he's not surprised. In fact, look at the next verse. He goes on in the next verse. Verse 10 says, the Bible says, in verse 10 it says, And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there how many times? Not once nor twice. After a while, the king said, who is a traitor? Who is the one telling the secrets to the enemy? Who is telling God's people how to get away from my attacks? And you know what they said? Listen to what they say. The Bible says, in verses 11, it says, then the, therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore trouble for this thing. And he called his servants, and he said unto them, will you not show me which of us is what? He said, how does he have this inside information? How does he have these secrets? And someone said, no, my king, it's not that there's a traitor, it's that God's people have a prophet. Look at what it says. Verse 13, the Bible said, verse 12, it says, and one of his servants says, none, my lord, O king, but Elijah, what? The prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. The Bible says that because of the prophet that the enemy cannot deceive us. If we listen and believe and study the words of a true prophet, the Bible makes it clear that the devil will look like an amateur magician. You would be able to see his tactics and tricks and you would say, come on, you can't do better than that devil. You see, everything that the devil's going to do, he has made known to his servants, the prophets. The Bible says, surely the God will do nothing, but reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. You see, brothers and sisters, the Bible is clear about this. Notice what it says in the book of Ephesians. What book did I say? Ephesians chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Do you know that the acceptance of a prophet is not optional? You know, sometimes a person says, well... I'll accept this prophet or I'll reject this prophet. You know that if a person is a true prophet, you don't have an option if you're a child of God at accepting. Brothers and sisters, a prophet is a prophet. And we must understand that God has given us a prophet as a gift. And do you know, brothers and sisters, that when God gives us something, God only gives us what we need. Do you think that God will give us something that we don't need? Then if we need what God has given us, won't you accept it? I mean, think of it this way. If a man came to a woman and he gave her a rose and the woman took a rose that the, the man gave her and threw on the ground and stomped on the rose, what would that say, say of how she felt about the man who gave her the rose? Would it say she loves him? If she took the gift of that rose and stepped on it, that the way she treated the gift shows how she feels of the giver of the gift. And if God has given us the gift of prophecy and we reject it, we show that we don't really love Jesus. In fact, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, notice what it says. In Ephesians 4, and when you get there, let me know by saying, amen. Beginning in verse 7, the Bible says that God has given gifts to us. In verse 7, the Bible says, but unto every one of us, how many? Every one of us has given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. That's eternal grace that's infinite grace verse 8 says wherefore he said when he ascended up on high he did what he led captivity captive and gave what and gave gifts unto men now let's see what these gifts are when jesus went back to heaven from the cross of calvary he died so that he can give us not only eternal life but he would give us added gifts so that we don't have to be lost that we can be saved even during a time of all of the apostasy and deception that the devil is going to bring on this world what are these gifts notice what the bible says beginning in verse 11 you're there amen verse 11 the bible says and he gave some what apostles and some what prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers he gave prophets now what was this gift for the bible says in verse in verse 12 it says for the perfecting of what of the saints for the work of the ministry 
for the edifying of the body of Christ because someone says, evangelists, how long are these prophets going to be among us? Well, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse 13, till we all come where? In the unity of the faith. And as long as we have so many different denominations, we know there's no unity of the faith. Is that right? And so prophets are going to be among us until there's one fold and one shepherd and one true church that prophets will be there until the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man until the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that is still meaning that prophets should be available to us today. Now, brothers and sisters, if we accept the prophets, you know, the Bible says we don't have to be deceived anymore. Look at what it says. Next verse. It says that we henceforth be what? No more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The Bible says that if we accept the prophets and the gift of prophecy, we don't have to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. We can know the truth and the truth would make us free. And so brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but if we need this prophet, I want to know what a prophet is. Amen. What is the prophet anyway? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Go to Deuteronomy. What book did I say? The word prophet means spokesman. A prophet is a man who speaks for God. He is God's mouthpiece. In fact, the Bible says it right here. Deuteronomy 18. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Deuteronomy 18, notice what it says. In Deuteronomy 18, beginning in verse 15. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 18, beginning, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 18. Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, the Bible says, I will raise what? Them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will do what? And will put the words of the prophet. God says, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So when a prophet speaks or writes, are they speaking of themselves? The prophet's words are the words of God. The prophet's writings are the writings of God. So re to reject the words of a prophet is to reject the words of God. And the Bible says it's not the words of man. It is not the words of woman. It is the words of God. And the Bible says that they are the words. So a prophet is simply a mouthpiece for God. It's one who speaks for God. Now, how does God speak to the prophets? Go to the book, to the book of Hosea. What book did I say? Hosea chapter 12. You see, we need to understand that the source of the prophet's wisdom is not the prophet's mind. You see, brothers and sisters, the source of the prophet's wisdom is of God, not of man. Man is not smart enough to write this Bible. Did you know that? The source of the prophet's wisdom is of God. God, from Genesis to Revelation, again and again, has used the ministry of prophets to save his people. In fact, notice what the Bible says, Hosea 12. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Beginning in verses 10 of Hosea 12, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, beginning in verse 10, the Bible says, I have also done what? God is the one speaking by the prophets. And I have multiplied what? visions and use similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. So the source of the prophet's wisdom is of who? It's of God. So a prophet's wisdom is of God. Now you must understand, everything that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. Did you know that? In fact, go back, go back in your Bibles now as we go back to Numbers chapter 12. To the book of Numbers chapter 12, I said that everything that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. God has a day of worship, Satan has a day of worship. God has the true seven-day Sabbath. Satan has the false counterfeit Sunday Sabbath of tradition. God has a church. Satan has a church. God has prophets. Satan has psychics. One source is of God. The other source is of the devil. Psychics communicate with the dead, which are not really dead. The dead don't know anything. We study that in these meetings. We know that psychics are communicating with the devil. Now, when psychics communicate, how do they get the information? They always use something. Sometimes they use tarot cards. Sometimes they use crystal balls. There are all different methods that the, 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 the psychics use. But what about 
God's prophets. Do they use crystal balls? The true prophet, he's not going to be going somewhere and you say, prophet, I need to know the truth. That true, true prophet is not going to say, well, let me pull out the horoscope. He's not going to say, oh, I need a crystal ball to help you. That prophet, he does not get his information through that method. Do you know how God speaks to prophets and gives them his information? Look at what the Bible says. There are three main ways. How many did I say? Three main ways. Notice what it says, beginning in verses 6. Numbers 12, verse 6. You're there, amen? The Bible says in verse 6, it says, and he said, Hear now my words. If there be what? If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him how? In a vision. And what else? And will speak to him in a dream, not with a crystal ball. Amen. He is going to use a what? A vision or a dream. That's two ways. In the nighttime, God may sometimes give prophets dreams that will show them the truth and will give them information. Or sometimes it may be a daytime. And God will let the prophet go into a vision even in the daytime. But there's a third way. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, With him I will speak how? Mouth to mouth even apparently and not in dark speeches and the solemnitude of the Lord shall he behold wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses who was the prophet the Bible says not only in visions and in dreams but mouth to mouth in other words God sometimes will send an angel to him he will come in person and the prophet will be able to behold his figure and God will speak to him mouth to mouth as a man speaks to a friend and so the three main ways, what are they, class? They are first, what? Vision. What else? Dream. And then what else? Mouth to mouth. This is what the Bible said. Did I make it up? We are reading from the Bible. Remember, everything we study makes sure that the Bible gives us the answer to it. And the Bible says, brothers and sisters, that the ministry of the prophets, God is going to use the three ways. Now let me ask you something. What did the prophets talk about? What did they prophesy about? Was there only one subject? Go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 28. What book did I say? In the book of Jeremiah chapter 28, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says that prophets prophesied of many different subjects. In Jeremiah 28, notice what it says. In Jeremiah 28 beginning and verse 8, notice what the Bible says. Jeremiah 28 verse 8. The Bible says, are you there, amen? Now the other day I was talking to somebody and they said, evangelist, you're going too fast. Am I going too fast? Jeremiah 28, verse 8. I'm trying to get, we're going to a point, brothers and sisters. You see, I want to tell you something so serious. Because if we don't understand how to tell a true prophet, we're going to be deceived. But I want you to get it, amen? Jeremiah 28, verse 8. Notice what it says. The Bible says, The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesy both of what? Against many countries against great kingdoms, of war, of evil, of pestilence, the prophet which prophesy of a peace. When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. The Bible says that prophets, they prophesied of many things. They talked about wars. They talked about crises in countries and nations. They talked about peace. They talked about, do you know that if you study through the Bible, that a prophet has spoken of everything we need in everyday life. It's given us counsels on marriage. It's given us counsels on how to raise children. It's given us counsels on diet and on health. Everything we need to know, whether in eating or in drinking or whatsoever we do, the prophet has given counsel concerning it. And even if a prophet dies, God has made a way for their counsel to be preserved. You know how to do it? Look at Isaiah chapter 30. What book did I say? Just before the book of Jeremiah. In the book of Isaiah chapter 30, the Bible knew, God knew that the devil would hate prophets. And the devil would try to kill many of them. And so God gave the prophet a way that if they were trying to attack a prophet, that his counsels could be preserved so that it would go on even if the prophet died. Notice what the Bible says. Isaiah 30, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verses 8, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, now go. Write it where? Before them in a table. And note it where? In a book 
that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. The Bible says that if a prophet, if he was about to die, he said, listen, take your writings and put it in a table, put it in a book, so that even if you die, the book does what? Lives on. In fact, the very reason the prophets that wrote this Bible, all of them are dead and gone unless they're preserved. And you know where, you know where the book is? The book is where? Still with us. And so the Bible says that if God has a prophet, one of the ways that the writings of the prophet would be preserved, even if they died, was that the writings were to be written down in a book so that they could be preserved. And brothers and sisters, the Bible is clear about this. The Bible has given us tests. Now let me ask you a question. If it is so serious that we have a prophet, that we need a prophet in the last days, does the Bible say that the prophets would come in the last days or are we all through with prophets? Look at the book of Joel. What did I say? In fact, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament. In the book of Acts, after Matthew, Luke, Mark, Luke, you'll get to the book of John and then you'll get to the book of Acts. We want to go to the book of Acts chapter 2 because someone says, evangelist, I see that a prophet is a mouthpiece. I see that a prophet speaks for the word of God. I see that you have given prophets before, but how do we know that there will be prophets in the last days? Notice what the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Acts chapter 2, notice what the Bible says. Beginning in verse 17, you'll believe the Bible, amen. Verse 17, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, and it shall come to pass that in what days? That in the last days, say of God, I will pour out my spirit upon what? All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall do what? Shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall do what? Shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall do what? God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit, and the spirit is going to make my people prophesy. Now, question. Did the Bible say that the spirit of prophecy, that the gift of prophecy would be manifested in the last days? Then should we look for a prophet in the last days? You know, I was with someone, and I want you to go in your Bible to the book of Acts 21. Go to Acts 21. I'll never forget. There was a man that I was talking to one time. And he said to me, he said, I have my Bible. I don't need prophets. And I looked at him and I said, well, you don't even have your Bible. He said, what do you mean? I said, if you have your Bible, you're supposed to believe in it. Amen. And I said, now, if we did not need prophets, then why did the Bible say that in the last days that God would send prophets? I said, then if you believe the Bible, then you need a prophet. And so any man who says he believes the Bible and yet rejects a prophet, he rejects the Bible. Because the Bible says that in the last days I'm going to give them a prophet. The Bible says in the last days that one of the gifts that he's going to bestow for the unity of the faith is the gift of prophecy. And rejecting the prophet, we're rejecting God. Now question, is the gift of prophecy only given to men? Can women receive the gift of prophecy? Now you remember, I don't want to just hear your opinion, amen? There are too many traditions today. Men are trusting in the ideas of men. Everything we believe must be based on the word of God. Amen. In fact, the Bible says, I'm going to pour my spirit on your sons and on your daughters. Acts 21, notice what it says. And when you get there, let me know by saying, amen. Acts 21, beginning in verse 8. Notice what it says. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to write down beside it, Judges 4.4. 4. In Judges 4.4, 4, it says something similar to what we read right here. In Acts 21, beginning in verse 8, the Bible says, And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came where? Unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Verse 9 says, And the same man had what? Four daughters, virgins, which did what? Which did prophesy. So does God allow women to have the gift of prophecy? And so men and women can all receive the gift because somebody says, well, if it's a woman, they may not have the gift of prophecy. But the Bible says that even women receive the gift of prophecy. What do you say? 
You see, these prophets came not by old time, by the will of men, but they moved as they, they, they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, brothers and sisters, this makes it very important. If God said that prophets are going to come in the last days, but he also said that there are going to be many false prophets and false Christs, and it was going to deceive many, I want to know how can we tell what a true prophet is? We know that the prophet's coming. We know that we should believe in a prophet. We know that in the last days that we need a prophet so that we're not deceived and tossed to and fro with every deception of men. But how can we tell what is a true prophet? Go to the book of 1 John. What book did I say? To the book of 1 John chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says. You see, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you, in fact, before we go to 1 John 4, go to Revelation 19. I'll come right back to 1 John 4. But in Revelation 19, I want to ask you this. Is miracles a sign of a true prophet? You know, some people, they say, well, man, if Benny Hinn heals thousands of people, he must be a prophet. Not even serious. Now, there are others, they say, if anybody does some miracle, they must be a prophet. Right now, if a man were to walk in this room, and there will be hundreds of people that were right here on, on the front row. And all of a sudden, one by one, they came up with broken legs. And all of a sudden, the man touched them on the head or the leg, and they were able to walk. Somebody would say, surely, that's a prophet. If you saw a man that was blind, and the man touched his eyes, and that man was blind, was able to see, the world would say, surely, that is a prophet. But my question tonight is, is the miracles a sign that someone is the true prophet? Where in the Bible do we know that? Look at what it says, Revelation 19. Revelation 19, 20. You're there, amen? Notice what it says, beginning in verse 20. The Bible says, and the beast was what? Was taken. And with him the what? With him the false prophet that did what? So the Bible tells us that false prophets will do what? They will work miracles and what will they do? The Bible says, and the false prophet that wrote, wrote, wrote miracles before him with which he did what? Deceive them that have received the mark of the beast, and them that worship this image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The Bible says that the false prophet will work miracles, and by them he will even deceive the world to accept the mark of the beast. So miracles are not a sign of a true prophet. Then what are the tests of a true prophet? Notice what the Bible says in 1 John, just before the book of Revelation. In 1 John chapter 4. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. And I praise God for these tests. You see, without these tests, we would not know. I'll never forget, I was in California. During a series of meetings, we were working in a meeting just like this. And we were going, and I remember going to one house. And I talked to this man that was giving Bible studies. You know, today, it seems like every church has a prophet. It seems like everywhere you go, someone is a self sent prophet. And I remember I went to this man's house, and he got up, and we started talking and studying the Bible. And he said something that was there. And I said, well, there's no text like that in the Bible. And that man said, no, it's not in the Bible. He said, but I'm a prophet. I said, oh, you're a prophet. Is that right? And I thank God for these tests of a prophet. And he said, you're a prophet? I said, you're a prophet? He said, yes. And I said, well, you know, the Bible gives certain tests of a prophet. And we were able to talk about some of those things, but I know that man was a false prophet. You know how I know? You know how I know? That man, he looked at me, he touched me on the shoulder, he said, young man, he said, in a few years, you're going to be very rich. That man was a false prophet. <laughs> Amen? He was a false prophet! And the Bible says, look at what it says in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4 verse 1, the Bible says, Beloved, believe not what? Every spirit. But try the spirits, whether they are God. Why? Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. The Bible says we can't believe every spirit. We must test the prophets. We must try them to see whether they're true or false. Now, time will not allow me tonight to go through all the tests. And so what I'm going to do tonight before we close, I'm going to give you some of the most prominent tests of a prophet. I'm going to give you both physical and spiritual tests so that you will be able to know for yourself how to tell a true prophet. And then I'm going to let you go home. Is that all right? Notice what the Bible says in the book of Daniel. What book did I say? Daniel chapter 10. We're going to look at the physical test first. Daniel chapter 10. The Bible gives both physical and spiritual tests of the prophet. And Daniel chapter 10, notice what the Bible says. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. And Daniel 10, the Bible is clear. And what you want to do, when you start studying the work of prophets, 
You want to make sure that you look at everywhere where God deals with the gift of prophecy. And you want to start seeing the physical manifestations and take note of it because every time God works, his workings with men are always the same. I want you to see some of the physical manifestations when the spirit comes on a man and gives him the gift of prophecy or the spirit of prophecy. Daniel 10, are you there, amen? Beginning in verse 16, one of the first signs of a true prophet, the Bible says that immediately when the, when, they, when the Spirit falls upon them and they go into prophecy and get ready to prophesy, they lose their physical strength. Sometimes they simply fall out. Look at what it says in verse 16. The Bible says, and behold what? One like the similar to the sons of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O oh my Lord, by the what? By the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I retain what? No strength. Sometimes when a man receives a vision who's a prophet, he literally loses all of his strength. In fact, look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. The Bible says, Therefore, speaking of the prophet Daniel, I was left alone and saw this great what? Vision. And there remained what? No strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. So the Bible is clear that one of the first tests of a prophet, the physical test, is that when they go into vision, normally they will lose all of their physical strength. Sometimes they literally just fall out, and it looks like they just fall and just get knocked out. It looks like they just fall out. The Bible says they lose their strength. Do you know what the next test is? One of the next things that happen, that after they come from the vision, the Bible says they receive supernatural strength. Look at what the Bible says in verse 19. The Bible says, I'm sorry, verse 18. The Bible says, then there came what? Again, and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and he did what? And he did what? And he strengthened me. Look at verse 19. And said, O man, greatly beloved. Fear not, peace be unto thee, be what? Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. The Bible says, as he was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. So first, they lose what? All strength, physically. Sometimes they fall out. And then afterwards, they receive what? Supernatural strength. They're strengthened. They're made very strong. And then the next thing that happens is that oftentimes they literally will lose their breath. They won't breathe at all. In fact, notice what the Bible says, Daniel 10, 17. Look at verse 17. Are you there? Amen. The Bible says, the Bible says in verse 17, it says, For how can the servant of my, uh, uh, this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remain of what? No strength in me, neither is there what? Breath left in me. Now you must understand, sometimes a prophet will go on vision for over two hours. Now if a person has no breath for two hours, that person is what? Is dead. But the prophet, God will supernaturally, when they go into vision, sometimes when they lose their ability to breathe, they will have no breath and yet the prophet will be all right. In fact, the Bible says another sign of the prophet is that even he will, he will not be aware sometimes of his physical surroundings and he will fall into a trance. Look at what the Bible says, Numbers 24. In the book of Numbers, what book did I say? Numbers chapter 24. Notice what the Bible says. So one of the first signs is that when they go into vision, what will happen? They lose their strength. What is the second thing that happens? They gain supernatural strength. Another thing that happened, they, they're not aware of their surroundings. And what happens to their breath? They, there's no breath within them. And sometimes for hours with no breath, they are in vision and they prophesy. This is supernatural. And then the Bible says that they fall into a trance. And when they fall into a trance, their eyes will be open. Look at what it says. Numbers 24. Beginning in verse 4. You're there, amen? In verse 4, the Bible says, He has said which have heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty. This is a prophet seeing the vision, seeing the vision of the Almighty. Notice what happens. Falling what? Into a trance, but having what? Having his eyes open. So when he fell into a trance or a vision, the Bible says that while he fell into a trance, his eyes would be what? Open. In fact, look at verse 16. In verse 16, the Bible says, He has said, 
which have heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the what? The vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes what? So one of the next signs, not only did we say that he would lose that train, not only would no breath be in him, but when he falls into a vision and a trance, his eyes would be what? Open. Now these are the physical tests of a prophet, and there are many more, but these are some of the physical manifestations of a man or a woman who is operating under the gift of prophecy. Now these are not enough though, brothers and sisters, because don't you know that the devil can make a man go through these type of things? The devil can make supernatural, physical manifestations. These are physical signs that are to help us to test, but these physical signs can be duplicated, but the spiritual signs cannot be duplicated. These are the most important. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Matthew, in the book of Matthew chapter 7, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Matthew 7, are you there, Amen. In Matthew 7, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verses 15, Jesus shows us how to test a true prophet. Matthew 7, beginning in verse 5, 15, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Matthew 7, verse 15, notice the words of Jesus. Beginning in verse 15, the Bible says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? Ravening wolves. Well, how can we tell the difference? The Bible says, verse 16, You shall know them how? By their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? When I go to a tree, if I see oranges, what type of tree is it? If I go to a tree and I see apples, what type of tree is it? The Bible says, You shall know them how? By their fruits. In fact, verse 20. The Bible says in verse 20 of the same chapter, it says, Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. You should be able to look at a prophet's life. And you should be able to see the fruit of the Spirit. You should be able to see the character of Christ, of love, joy, peace, of all the character. They should be leading souls to Jesus and back to the words of the living God. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, what book did I say? Deuteronomy chapter 18, the Bible says, not only must they have the fruit of the Spirit, not only must their life bear a Christian life, they should not only be teaching truth, but their life should be in harmony with the teachings. You know there are many men that have claimed to be prophets, and when they have investigated them, they have found out that these men have been thieves stealing old people's monies. They have searched some of these prophets and ministers and evangelists and they find out that while they say one thing, that these same men are holding parties where they're having drugs in their home and people are dying because of what these prophets are called to do. The Bible says, by their fruits, you shall know them. But not only the fruits, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 18, that when they speak, that when they prophesy of future events, that everything that the prophet says must come to pass. In Deuteronomy 18, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Beginning in verses 18, the Bible says, I will raise them up a prophet from among them, their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Verse 19 says, And it shall come to pass that whatso whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. And someone says, well, how will we know who this prophet is? Verse 20, the Bible says, but the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that prophet, or, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall do what? shall die. That's serious. Verse 21 says, and if thou shalt say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Verse 22 says, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which what? which the Lord have not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, 
Thou shalt not be afraid of him. The Bible says that when God gives a word to the prophet, when he gives them a prophecy, everything that he says that there's going to come to pass, it is going to take place. And if the prophet words does not come to pass, God did not speak it, and you don't have to be afraid of that prophet. Now, brothers and sisters, every prophet, when they speak, everything they say must come to pass. But do you know that even the devil can sometimes tell future events? I have prophesied and told people of things that were going to happen in their life. And God didn't tell me them, but I knew human nature. And the devil understands things that are going to take place before they happen. So not only must the prophet tell us what is going to happen, but notice what it says in Deuteronomy 13. And Deuteronomy 13, notice what it says as we get ready to bring this message to a close. And Deuteronomy 13, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. And Deuteronomy 13, beginning in verses 1, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says not only must the prophet tell us what is going to come to pass, because you know there was a man by the name of Notre Dame. And he prophesied of some future events, and some of them have taken place. But that man is not a true prophet. Did you know that? That, man, that is a false prophet. In fact, the Bible tells us how to tell a true prophet. In Deuteronomy 13, it says, If there arise among you what? A prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign and a wonder. And the sign or the wonder come to pass. Wherefore he spake unto thee. Wherefore he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after what? Other gods, which thou hast not known. And let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God does what? Prove of you. To know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, you shall walk at the Lord your God and you shall fear him and do what? And keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. In fact, the Bible says in verse 5, and that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to you to do what? to turn you away from the Lord your God, if ever, listen to me, if ever a prophet, I don't care how many things he said has come to pass, if ever a prophet seeks to turn you from the Lord Jesus Christ and from the God of heaven, this is not a prophet of God, no matter how many miracles have been done. For the devil himself will make himself an angel of light. He will come down and will say that he is a false prophet and he will deceive many by turning him away from the truth of the living God. And God has given us these physical and spiritual tests. But brothers and sisters, if we have missed all of this, if we cannot remember all of these things that have come to, come to pass, there is one test that will never fail. One test, if you can't remember, you say so all of a sudden, here's somebody that says, I'm a true prophet. And you say, well, now I can't remember what those physical tests were. I can't remember what those physical tests were. There's one test. That is the acid test. That will never go wrong. The book of Isaiah. What book did I say? Isaiah chapter 8. This is the test we need tonight. You see, God has given us physical signs and spiritual signs. He's shown us through the mouth of the prophet. He speaks for God. And the way we see these tests, we see them. But the acid test is right here. Isaiah 8, beginning in verses 20. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. The Bible says, beginning in verse 20. To the law. Let's go back to verse 19. Oh, I love it. Don't you love the Bible? The Bible is sweet. i never forget. Let me tell you this before we read this test. I remember when I used to hate the Bible. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, make the Bible the sweetest thing to me in all the world. And I saw with the Bible where God took this book and made this boring book that was boring to me become the most interesting book in all the world. I said, Lord, it's wonderful. I knew what David meant in Psalms when he said, the words of the Lord are sweeter than honey. It's sweet. And Isaiah 8, 
Beginning in verse 19, the Bible says, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, talking about those psychics, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? Then they ask the question, for the living to the dead, should a man that's alive go to the dead? Now the dead, they don't know anything. Verse 20, what shall we do? To the law 